And we're joined now by Jay Ryan. Jay Ryan is the creator of the Classical Astronomy Update. It's an email astronomy newsletter, especially for Christian homeschool families. Uh, welcome to the show, Jay. Good morning, Brian. Thanks for having me on. Now, one Ron Eastwood did a deep dive, and he discovered that you're <laughs> a Moody Radio guest veteran. You've been on Chris Fabry a few times, I guess, huh? Oh, that's a long time ago, but yeah, that happened. <laughs> Chris is a great guy. It's 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 fun to hear you've been on some Moody Radio programs before. Uh, now, before we dig into some of the astronomy type questions, I'm always curious to learn how people stumble into their passions. Like, what's the backstory on why you you love astronomy? Well, I'll keep it short. I was a little tiny kid back in the '60s when we were going to the moon with the Apollo program, yeah. and that inspired that inspired my life greatly. Uh, when I got older, um, actually, I was in my 20s, and, and I, w I was really seeking God. I was really praying hard, asking for direction for my life. And uh, long story short, classical astronomy is what came out of it, out of all that prayer and fasting that I did back in the 80s. Can you can you take us back to the? It, it must have been the moon landing that that grabbed you, huh? What was it about that, and and what what do you remember about watching that? It was the whole space program of that period. Uh, it kind of culminated in, in uh, July of 69 with Neil and Buzz on the moon, but the whole lead-up was very exciting. I vividly remember Apollo 8 on Christmas Eve 1968, and uh, they, uh, the astronauts read the first chapter of Genesis while they were orbiting the moon, and you had this wow. little view looking at the lunar craters as they were reading it. And they got in a lot of trouble with Madeline Marie O'Hare, who was a, a, a <laughs> Writing atheist of the period who complained about the government spending tax dollars to read the Bible, you know. So yeah. uh, the whole period was very exciting. I, if anybody who wasn't alive, I can't explain the excitement of the period. It was a great time to be a little kid. Yeah, you know, my my wife and I are in the midst of watching the the series. We're getting caught up in life on the Crown, and there was a whole episode devoted to the moon landing and how much uh, Prince Philip was just captivated by it. Uh, and I think it's hard for those of us who didn't live through it to understand just how big of a deal the space program was in the '60s. Can you help those understand it who weren't living through it? Well, it was uh, it was it was a media event for sure. Um, it was it was inspiring. I mean, you know, it had only been a quarter century since we fought Hitler. Uh, the World War II generation was you know still very much in, in control of things, and there was this very much this this can do American spirit. Like, hey, we can we can do anything that we set our minds to that we determined to and and you know the whole thing was in the midst of this of this humility before god which we don't see in this generation i mean um the, the first thing that buzz aldrin did when the when the lunar capsule landed on the moon was he took communion in accordance with his denomination uh and and just celebrating the lord's supper and he had a little short reading from the psalms that he did wow uh, it was it was it was just it was just very inspiring P people also forget that during the Apollo 13 disaster, there was the Apollo 13 prayer watch, which uh, people all over Houston throughout NASA and then elsewhere had this extended prayer vigil that they were keeping for Apollo 13. And the Lord answered that prayer. Those three men amazingly made it home when the odds in the natural were very much against them. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it, I marvel when I think back at the idea that in that time period of American history, based on where technology was, I mean, calculators took up an entire room or something. And yet right. we managed to do this. We got men to the moon. It's just incredible. And now, you know, a, a whole bunch of people will look up at space, right, a, as astronomers, as you are, and they see chaos or they see, um, you know, lack of a creator. But you see the fingerprint of God. So what, what is it about space that, that inspires you to see Jesus? Well, it's what I do with classical astronomy. It, it, is, it is just this incredible mathematical order that exists uh, that, that enables us to, in the sky, in, in, the, in the celestial you know, um, space above, that, that allows us to be able to tell time and navigate strictly from looking at the sun, moon, and stars. And, and it's very much a down-to-earth thing. You know, I, I don't, honestly, I don't really like the term space because it kind of connotes something, you know, away from the earth. I mean, this is something we, we do very much on the earth. And uh, for all of those centuries, people in creaky wooden ships would sail the globe they would sail from london to you know to the new world and to sydney and all of this kind of thing just using the stars and, yeah. and to me that is incredible and we don't know anything about that today we have our generation has completely forgotten all of that yeah i think we're almost less dependent on it right you're, you're right the what wasn't it the astrolabe that people used for centuries to just it, it, there was mathematical precision in the heavens and it was the only Definitely. way to navigate that's right you can actually do mathematics and this was known in ancient times i mean um astronomy is was one of the uh, sciences of the quadrivium, if you're familiar with the seven liberal 
arts, the trivium and the quadrivium. It, it was the only mathematical uh, science of the natural world that was known in ancient times. And that goes to say something about how important it was to them in times past. Absolutely. Uh, again, it's 744. Our guest is Jay Ryan. Again, he's creator of the Classical Astronomy Update. It's an email astronomy newsletter, especially for Christian homeschool families. When we come back from this break, uh, there's going to be a big convergence here in Northeast Ohio of astronomy and history. We'll talk more about that, plus uh, some other astronomical things with our friend Jay Ryan in just a few minutes. 749 WCRF Mornings with Brian. With us now, Jay Ryan. He is creator of the Classical Astronomy Update. It's an email astronomy newsletter, especially for Christian homeschool families. Also been on Chris Fabry Live before, uh, and we're so glad that he's with us today as we talk about various things um, astronomical. First one, uh, I I would like to object to how we determine when summer is. I like to to determine summer by temperature. (laughs) Tell me I'm wrong. Well, of course it's a factor, uh, but then again, uh, the warmest days are after the actual uh, solstice itself, so uh, uh, it's not strictly by temperature. The sun, the, the Earth needs some time to soak up some heat in order to get its warmest temperatures. Mm-hmm. So how, how is that calculated again? Like if someone wants to know what is the date that summer will officially start according to astronomers, how do you figure that out? Well, you know, that's today. That's, uh, that's June 21st, oh. and it is the, yeah, today is the summer solstice. The <laughs> I should have known that. First day of summer. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, anyway, it's, uh, it, what it means is that the sun reaches its northernmost point above the northern hemisphere on that day, which is to oh. say it reaches its northernmost position in the sky. It's closest to the north celestial pole, you know, the north star and all that Polaris. So uh, that's uh, basically what what it what it signifies, and, and it and it, uh, it you know it's a it's a kind of a precise way of doing things. So then, of course, this is going to reveal how bad I am at both math and science, so forgive me, but is it safe to assume since it's mathematically determined that it's always this day, or is it shift in, on the calendar? It does shift slightly. Uh, you, you're aware that we have, a, we have leap year every four years, so yes. basically the actual length of the year is 365 days and a little bit less than six hours. So uh, every four years we have to add a day to the calendar to keep the dates of the seasons lining up properly uh, with with the actual position of the sun. So uh, yeah, but it's, it can either be on June twentieth or June twenty first, and it could be at different hours of the day for that reason because there's this little almost six hour shift. So what what hour does it start today? Do we, do we know that? Yeah, uh, good question. I believe I didn't look it up uh, before, but I do believe that the actual time is ten fifty eight a.m. Uh, you might want to check me on that, but I think that's the, the correct time. It's a lot more precise than I would have guessed. I, uh, I had no idea. But uh, I feel like Lauren should buy the team some sort of lunch at that time to celebrate summer. Don't you think, Lauren? Well, isn't it too bad that I'm here in Chicago? Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. The internet doesn't have delivery service? I forgot about that. Okay, but yeah. Okay, so 1058 is likely when it is. It's today, first day of summer. Happy summer to you, uh, Jay Ryan. I also wanted to have a few moments where you describe to us... Uh, the privilege we have of being in Northeast Ohio next year. Uh, talk about the big thing happening. It is indeed a privilege. We are going to have a total eclipse of the sun passing over two-thirds of the state of Ohio, and particularly Cleveland. And it, it will be uh, when the moon blocks the sun for a period of time. Actually, the shadow of the moon upon the Earth moves along a path that will begin in the Pacific Ocean. It'll pass over Mexico, Texas, and then eventually make its way to Cleveland and then beyond into Canada and out to sea. Uh, this has not happened in Cleveland, Ohio since 1806. This is a oh. really big deal. Ron, what was that like in 1806? It was really cool. <laughs> Let I me bet. tell you. <laughs> it was a big to-do, as they say. You right. had to hurry up, get the horse over to the right spot. That's right. We had to hurry and do the harvesting so we could take time and watch the sun. <laughs> <laughs> but and, and Ron has also regularly had a total eclipse of the heart, but not a total eclipse <laughs> of the sun, in his view. So... Uh, yeah, now, now, you have to have the right glasses or something to do this, but you can look at it, right? No? Yes, you can You can look at the partial phases, and really the partial phase is the whole big buildup. you got to be able to, uh, to see the moon begin to pass over the face of the sun. You need special glasses to do that. But once it's total, it is totally safe to look at a total solar eclipse. So the sun will be wow. completely obscured at that point. So then, I mean, to, to what extent does it get super dark? I mean, is it still fairly light out, or is it going to feel like nighttime? It'll 
feel like nighttime, especially when it first happens. It's just kind of a deep stage of twilight, but the, the brightness of the sun drops by about a factor of a thousand within a, a short few seconds, and it, it's pretty it's pretty dramatic. It's uh, very exciting. And now, th- these happen fairly regularly, but not necessarily right over where we are. You usually have to travel to see it, as I recall, right? Correct. They, they happen in different parts of the world. Uh, there's one every year or so, every two years maybe, but they're in any given location. It's something like 343 years between eclipses. So we went in 1806. We'll have another one in 2444. Have you seen the? Have you seen one before a total eclipse? Yeah, we were in Tennessee during 2017, which had been the first one over the United States in many years, and uh, yeah, that was very exciting. Yeah, I've I've missed that one, so I'm excited to see this this particular one. And if we're not paying attention, we'll just know that we're all okay, even though it gets totally dark. And uh, what 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 time does this take place? Is it a, it's a precise time, right? It is three thirteen p.m. Hmm. All right. Well, Lauren, write that down. We're gonna you're gonna have to buy us lunch for that too. Late lunch. Yeah, I'm so excited. I'm gonna live in Ohio by then. I know you are. <laughs> what yeah. a time. Uh, see, it's it's meant to be, as they say. <laughs> Uh, so, Jay Ryan, I know you have lots of information like this available for folks via email as a regular update, particularly those uh, people who are doing homeschooling. Uh, how can people learn more about what you're doing, find your website, and get this email? Well, you can sign up for my newsletter. Go to classicalastronomy.com, and uh, there's a there's a sign-up form there. Um, if you want to learn about the, the eclipse, uh, the site is eclipseovercleveland.com. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if, if you miss those, just text us. We, we'd love to uh, get you that information. Again, Jay Ryan, is uh, he releases the Classical Astronomy Update, and I highly encourage you to go check it out. And we'll have to check back in with you as we get closer to that day. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks that'd again, great. Jay Ryan, for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. Take care. Have a good day.